Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I am here at Rocket Lab's brand new launch facility in Walbs, Virginia. This is Mars Pad Zero C. And this will allow Rocket Lab to launch their awesome little electron rocket from the United States. You know, right now they only have Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. This is Launch Complex 2. And I still have a lot of questions, especially, you know, Rocket Lab is working on reusability for their awesome electron rocket. So I wonder if there's anyone that could, you know, answer a few more questions about that whole thing. Yeah. You mind if we uh, talk up here at your... Like, on your, on your launch pad? No. <laughs> so I guess let's uh, talk to someone that knows a lot about everything Rocket Lab. Hmm. Well, don't fall in the pit, don't fall in the pit, don't fall in the pit. Hey, Peter. Hey, Tim. Good How to see you again. You freezing your butt off out here? Yes. <laughs> well, it's a good place to end the year, though. We're it almost is a 2020. Place. Yep. And you guys had an unbelievable year. Yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of the team for 2019. I think uh, I think we can end up this year with a with a smile on our face. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you ended up with six launches, right? Yep. And you ended up with uh, two launch pads now online. Yep. And you ended up working on recoverability. Yeah, yeah. No, we we achieved uh, pretty. Decent milestone with recoverability, actually. It was, yeah, it was way better than we expected. As you know, that's probably, that's what I want to start on, because that's <laughs> really exciting. So, yep. you, so you're sitting back here, Mr. I don't know, you know, probably not going to try, you know, recoverability, there's not margins in it. First off, tell me what, what kind of closed for you on that concept mm. that maybe there is room, maybe it's worth it. Just run me through your thought process there. So small launch vehicles are notoriously difficult, right? Because um, the margin in a small launch vehicle is so tight. Yeah. Um, when you've only got 150 kilograms of payload to play with, mm -hmm. adding 100 kilograms of parachutes just it just right. is very difficult to trade. Yeah. So um, what really what really got me thinking is I started to look at the data mm -hmm. and started to see you know how well stage one was surviving. Mm -hmm. We got good um, you know good measurements of uh, during ascent of, of the environments and mm -hmm. really I started understanding you know everything that was going on. And then also um, trying to uh, increase launch cadence at the same time. And steering out into a factory um, where we knew we were going to have to double the size of this factory and just keep on building more and more machines and automating more and more and more. And, uh, you know, it just sort of became obvious, well, you know, the, the data doesn't say that it's insane. Uh, it says it's difficult, but it's not. We're not breaking any laws of physics here. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I formed a small team within the company and we, we started to, to go after it. Do you have just like a chalkboard full of Wiley Coyote style, like what's going to work for us? Yeah, I mean there was there was plenty of whiteboard sessions, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Wait, share with me like one other one before you before you landed on. Was there even something close, another contender before you landed on trying to do the air recovery? Yeah, I mean we we looked at um, we looked at landing it in a in a net, not, not dissimilar that to SpaceX does it with its fairings. Obviously, we looked at propulsive um, reentry, but that was you know. You only you don't even get half a napkin filled out before you realise that's not going to work. <laughs> um, and then uh, yeah, there was there was uh, there was all sort of all different concepts from the team. Um, uh, you know, giant drones and uh, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I guess we're going to pop right into that because that's actually so. I, I do a podcast with some guys. It's mm -hmm. called Our Ludicrous Feature, and each week uh, we take people's questions of, you know, why don't they just? Yeah, yeah, right. And that was a good one. It was, yep. why don't they just use a giant drone? You guys yep. already have batteries, you have yep. motors, yep. you know, and it could be cheaper than operating a helicopter. Yep. You could even do four of them that fly in unison. Mm. Why didn't that end up working out? Well, I mean, I'm trying to get my helicopter's license. I know. So, <laughs> so using a helicopter is great. Is this just you wanting to fly a helicopter no, more often? No, no, no. But the, I mean, there's there's a small a small element of that. But um, <laughs> but but no. I mean, media recapture with a helicopter. It's been done before. Right. Um, and I know a lot of people look at that and they sort of they sort of think, man, that's that's super super tricky. And how are they going to pull that off? But really, that that is that that that's relatively ac academic compared right. to actually re-entering the stage and getting it through one bit. Right. Well, and there's. Did you work with the company that was based out of was it Scotland or England that has the recovery system? Really? No, no. Okay, because you know everyone, of course, on the internet immediately saw what you guys are working on and go, "Well, this has already been done." Here's a video of a company recovering a. a it was a mock-up booster with a you right. know parafoil and. Yeah, I mean, and it's been done. Uh, you know, Lockheed Martin did it. Uh, I think it was in, in the '90s to try and recover some um, uh, some reentered uh, artifacts. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's in. You know, if you if you go back far enough, you look at the Corona missions. Although it wasn't a helicopter, yeah. it's still the same gig. Right. Same. Um, yep. So getting through reentry, popping a chute, yep. swooping it out before yep. it hits the water. Yep. 
that's pretty much it. And how much time do you have between when the parachutes deploy and before it, it hits the ground? Yeah, so that's the idea of the parafoil is we can steer it into the wind and mm -hmm. you know maximize the hang time there. Oh, cool. So you could have up to 20 minutes. Really? Mm -hmm. So you could have multiple attempts with the, yeah. with the helicopter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we, you know, we're trying to limit the descent rate to a maximum of ten meters a second. So you, you know, you get you get a decent opportunity to yeah. to go and scoop it. Okay, that's pretty cool. So, so I guess no no autonomous drones in the near time future. No, no, no. There was there was talk of autonomous ships at one point, um, but but no, um, okay. no autonomous drones at this point. Okay, so that's your why don't they just use <laughs> Pete drones? Pete flying a helicopter. Because Pete loves <laughs> flying helicopters. That's why. No. Okay. So propulsive. Uh, that came up in, in a lot of discussions of people yeah. saying, you know, why don't they do propulsive reentry? The simple answer most likely is that you don't need it. Your booster can survive. It survived the wall. Yeah, it did survive the without wall. Without propulsive and, and, slowdown. And not only did it survive the wall, um, it, it's the worst possible, you know, descent you could imagine. Um, there was absolutely no deceleration device on it whatsoever. So it was just right. coming in screaming hot. Huh. So, okay. A couple questions come out of that, so I'm just going to keep digging through yeah. here because, um, can does the uh, does your engine, the Rutherford, does it actually have relight capability? Uh, it well, I mean, we don't use T-tab; we use um, an igniter torch. So, oh, okay. uh, so yes, it, it does. Okay. Um, but we don't we don't actively use it. I mean, there's a few things we need to do. We, we'd need to you know purge the chambers with some nitrogen and stuff, mm -hmm. but we don't actually use it uh, on the launch vehicle. But yeah. it's relative, relatively trivial to, to make it relightable. But you've never had missions or anything where you need a relight? No. And that's what the kick stage is for? Yeah, well, the kick stage is beautiful because it um, it's, it's a right size propulsion system for you know trying to trying to circularize and insert really, really accurately. Right. It's the trouble with doing the, kind of the second light on the stage too, is that, you know, you're only lit for a few seconds and it's just a big thump. Right. Whereas a curry, it burns for like 20 or 30 seconds and you just, right. you just get exquisite accuracy. Yeah, yeah, you have a, a long, it's such a low thresh or you can just like do a tiny little bit oh, of burn, right? And I tell you, there is there is nothing more satisfying than when we do the circularization burn in the trims. Is you know on on mission in mission control, we we have you know the couple of lines, you know the, the target line and then then the ascent line, yep. and just watching those two lines just inch together can, and converge over thirty seconds is just incredibly satisfying. <laughs> and they just <laughs> and they just pop. It's just beautiful. Oh, that is actually amazing. And and I there was a recent SpaceX mission where you know they have such an overpowered upper stage with mm. their Merlin engine. Where they, I think they lit it for like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't even. It was like a half a second or yep. something. And yeah. It was just like. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Wow! Yeah, I yeah. can't imagine the startup transients and all that stuff just for that one quick little yep. jolt. Yeah. And you guys are able to with when now you upgraded too your photon. And do you still do do you fly photon? and Kiri separate or is it all just photon now? Yeah, no, so, well, it's a bit of a debate really. So um, the kick stage is really just a photon now, um, okay. but we have different variants. So we have a monopropellant mm -hmm. kick stage and a bipropellant mm -hmm. kick stage. So, um, you know, for missions that don't require the extra performance, we just prefer to run monopropellant because yeah. it's just, you just got to open a valve, that's yep. it. Yep. Um, but for higher performing missions, we, we run the bipropellant. How much, uh, what's the specific impulse difference between monoprop and, and Oh, it's quite big. Um, you know, it would be probably 50 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that. So it's pretty okay. decent. And how much Delta V does that afford you when you go to the dual prop? Uh, I can't remember the exact number um, because it depends on um, what propellant, um, you know, propellant tank combination we're running as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a lot of flexibility in that in that that upper stage to you know to really change it up depending on missions. I mean. Flight 10, we um, we flew to a high orbit to 400 k's, and then um, we did a relight and, and lowered, and then deployed some more. So, you know, more and more of these missions we're finding, we do multiple relights and yeah. change orbits and stuff. So. Yeah, that's it's a valuable value to the customer to be able to go directly mm, to mm. where they need to go. They don't have to have their own propulsion. Well, that's and the whole do all point of stuff. dedicated rocket, right? Yeah. I mean, if if you, if you can't do that, then you know it's right. a rideshare. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, do you guys still have a mission going out to the moon? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Is that so? D how much of the of that is riding on the kick stage? Is the kick stage the full TLI? Yeah. It's it's photon. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Basically, just take a photon to the moon. Wow. Yeah. It has that much delta V. Case. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like I say, we can configure it and change change tank configurations. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, a photon to the moon is just basically a big tank on top of the payload deck, and you know, everything is already there. All the guidance comms right. and everything's right. just there. So it's, yeah. it's just, and you know, we we are architected the Curry engine um, in, in a way that it could burn for for you know a very long time. So wow. um, yeah, it's 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 not. Would it take multiple? I'd assume it would take yeah. multiple. Yeah, yeah, you want to optimize just, it. Yeah, yeah. 
That's so yeah, direct that will be expensive, but that will be really exciting to see. Yeah, that. yeah. I mean, just thinking that a rocket this size, a relatively small rocket, will be able to take a payload to the moon. I yeah, mean. and I think it, it it's exciting in a lot of fronts because it, it opens up. Um, you know, so many different opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, TLI injection is, is great, but you know, you, we can also go to geo. We can do a heliocentric mm -hmm. orbit. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. Yeah, um, which is really exciting. I didn't even think about geo. I'm sure there's never been a rocket this small putting anything in geostationary orbit, right? No, no, I'm sure. I mean, not even yeah. close. Yeah. That so that's pretty amazing. Um, one of the things that that everyone's you know definitely questioning is yep some of the hardware that's required to do some of your recovery stuff. Mm -hmm. um, is that one of the reasons you also went dual prop is to make up for that Delta V difference? Uh, yeah, I mean, wherever we, I mean, we're continually trying to improve the performance of Electron mm -hmm. uh, to both gain margin um, and also offset the, you know, the changes that we're making with mm -hmm. recovery. Um, but, um, you know, if, like I said before, if, if, if a mission doesn't require it, then we generally won't put it on, we'll just run monopropellant. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, has, Overall, have you done any changes to batteries or optimization of the engines between flight one and ten now? That have uh, it's, it's amazing, really. Um, remarkably few systems have really changed. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've understood the systems better, so we've been able to you know pull back margin. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's been no kind of major rearchitect of, of of really any system. Um, okay. You know, we'll, we'll continue. Um, you know, this year or 2020, we'll continue to kind of tweak and make a few improvements along the way, mm -hmm. uh, because we will be adding, you know, a bit of a bit of mass on stage one to to recover. So, we'll, you know, we've got a pretty pretty simple roadmap there to add performance to the vehicle. If you don't mind me asking, how much mass is added for first stage recoverability? It re it really de it really depends on. Um, on how successful the you know the the, the ballistic descents are mm -hmm. with parachutes, mm -hmm. um, is I mean I, I would imagine probably no more than 150 kgs on stage one. Uh, but you have to remember the ratio. Yes, so about, is it about four to one? Oh, and actually on the electron it's much much more than that because um, stage two does so much so much of the work. So huh. um, you know we it's probably more like eight to one on a stage really? one. Really? Yeah. So we can we can carry a lot of. A lot of mass so, down there. To I, I should also explain for for those uh, watching or listening. That means basically they can add a bunch of weight to the first stage. And it doesn't take nearly as much payload penalty as it does exactly. if you were to stick that same weight on the upper stage. Yeah. So an eight. So you add eight kilograms to the first stage, it only detract about one kilogram from your payload Correct. capability. Yep. So um, I guess that's uh, another question. Then is uh, has there ever been any thoughts? Well, I, I, okay, I'm going to ask this first. How much specific impulse is your upper stage? So the 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 Rutherford or the or rubber, the Rutherford yeah sorry the Ruther, the Rutherford upper stage yeah so it's it's around about three forty two I think around oh. about there it's high performance it's yeah. a screaming little engine yeah yeah it's about ninety seven percent sea star efficient it's yeah ninety seven ninety eight it's 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 a screamer so has there ever been any thoughts of going with a a different propellant on the upper stage or the first stage like methane you guys looked into methane yeah not really I mean I I I, I love I love I love Kiro. Kiro, I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about, well, it's easier to have two cryogenic propellants than one cryogenic and one not. Um, well, I prefer not to deal with another right. cryogenic propellant right. personally, especially one that's a bit flamey. I mean, <laughs> if you've seen, um, you've seen, uh, you know, some of the some of the stuff from SpaceX recently, you know, that, that methane is sure likes to go on fire a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kiro much different like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's probably some performance upgrades there, but the, just the just the the handleability of kerosene and right. just the ease of it. It's just, yeah. you know, we, we're what we're trying to do here is just just churn launch yeah. out. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, adding systems that add complexity is not not really a gig. And that's I was I was gonna say that is almost like your calling card. It's like <laughs> keep it as simple as possible. Like mm -hmm. everyone wants to, and this is again very much an armchair engineer thing. There's very much fans of aerospace going like. But they could probably launch 400 kilograms if they switch to this and this and yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what's the trade-off benefit of that? Yeah. Are you actually going to increase your amount of customers' payload opportunities? Exactly. X, Y, Z for all these new complications, all this new R and D. Yep. I remember, you know, we spoke about aerospikes last time I talked yep. to you, and that's one of those. That's the perfect example of yep. like, maybe it might help in some things or improve certain situations, but by the end of the day, it, even if you get it working perfectly, how yep. much did you spend to get it working? That's right. And, and is it worth it in the long run? Yeah, you might exactly you right. end up right back on page one, you know? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so optimizing the upper stage. Mm. Uh, so probably not going to liquid methane or any other cryogenic fuels or changing up systems. Yep. Um, I've always had a question, uh, mm. two questions about upper stage. Okay. You ditch both batteries at the Correct. same time. Correct. Why, is there a reason you don't stage them one and then the other? Yeah, I mean, the payload gained by doing that is relatively minor. 
Mm -hmm. um, so um, the beauty of staging two at once is you don't introduce any talk offsets mm. because they they know one, each other out. Right. They Whereas if you poke one off, then you sort of punch one way and the other. And look, the the you know the guidance will deal with that no problems at all. You may see the guidance when you punch both them off, it just doesn't even didn't yeah. even know it's yeah. there. Um, and same with the fairing. So um, really, really that came about just you know from day one, just trying to minimise risk and. Um, yeah, for, for just a tiny amount of payload, it's right. just, just don't introduce more yeah. risk. Yeah, again, the whole don't introduce more risk. Mm. Um, second stage has a bunch of sparks that always shoot out of the <laughs> yeah, nozzle. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's that from again? Yeah, so um, so the Rutherford engine is is really high performance, and what, what that actually is, I know it's quite funny. You know, you see you see people talking. Oh, it must have a little blade of nozzle, despite the fact it's glowing bright red. Right, but, right. Um, but no, they are they're little soot deposits. So the soot deposits kind of build up on the injector face like stalactites, and then mm -hmm. um, they get to a certain size and then break free, and then that's a soot entrained. It's a carbon entrained into the exhaust plume. Really. Yeah. Really. So that's so that's your soot of RP1. Yep. Wow. And yep. shooting out as little what little looks like sparks. little sparks. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah, but that 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 injector, you know, the efficiency is is it's it's a good injector. So it's really it's really. Are you guys doing on face like? Do you go do you go coaxial or what do you? It's a good injector. It's a good injector. <laughs> Keeping it tight. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so so we've talked about that. We talked about uh, the injections talked about uh, methane mm. sparky engines um, okay so back to back to recoverability we're yep. gonna we're gonna wrap this all around sure you didn't have to do any aero systems at all for your recoverability not not any aero appendages um, but you know the whole the whole stage was guided through RCS yeah. so little reaction control rocket little motors. tiny they're yeah, cute yeah, yeah they're, they're little, cute. little yeah, guys yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. but that's enough control authority to keep you pointed in the right direction yeah so it's it's really interesting um, you know the, the the you know the kind of dynamic stability of the stage in the in the hypersonic regime is 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 it's when we get into the subsonic regime then it wants to turn itself backwards mm. but during the hypersonic regime it's actually quite stable because um, of the engines being first the and engines and the batteries are all at the bottom so all the yeah. masses at, ma masses down there at yeah. the bottom um, so uh, you know when we so we, we about um, about five seconds after uh, second stage uh, ignited we started the um, the kind of manoeuvre mm -hmm. uh, and the first manoeuvre was to do a flip around yep. and then um, align with the re-entry corridor and um, that, oh, that was so good oh. too because I had that I had that on my screen as well I was watching that very carefully and and um, you know, just watching those rates come down and they just all converge down to zero. I was like, ah, this is good. Oh. So when they all, this thing's just sitting bang on zero, I thought, this is good. And then, um, then you know, we started to, to you know, reach apogee, and then then you see the you know the the, re the you know the alignment vector come all good, and then it just stayed all good. Um, wow. And the little engines are firing away and doing their thing, and we saw a bit of roll. Um, but roll is the least damped axis, so yeah. you know it's yep. it's always hard to hard to deal with roll. Um, yep. And you're not having to relight engines, so it doesn't really you don't no, have to worry care. about you know Actually, tank slosh or anything. Roll's good. It's a bit of barbecue roll. It's good, so you don't you <laughs> oh, don't yeah. you don't cook things up. But um, you know, all credit to the GNC team. You know, they were they were committing code at two o'clock in the morning for weeks and weeks, mm -hmm. um, and and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So yeah, those guys. Are, they're just, <laughs> I mean, you see the accuracy of the vehicle, and it's all down to those guys. They're yeah. just, uh, they're just incredible. That's incredible. amazing. And what does, the, what do, what do those little RCS thrusters run on? Are they just coal, coal gas? Coal gas. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that's enough. To st I just, it's so hard to picture. There's so little. Yeah, but if you're, if you're in the corridor, it's good. It's, it's only a problem if you get out of the corridor. Oh yeah. So the corridor is super narrow, and if you kind of get out of the corridor, then that, that's when the plasma knives come back out, and mm. you know, you just trip a shockwave boundary and just attach, and you're done. But if you can just, you know, just sit in that, in that nice little wake mm -hmm. with the big bow shock in front of you yep. then um, life's good <laughs> it's so unbelievable that we're talking about you know that's a possibility now you're just literally sending it back through the mm. atmosphere and it's it's coming in there's parts of that that are as hot as the sun yep. and you're able to survive and did you have to beef up you know heat shield around your your structure and stuff like that compared to previous flights well i mean no, this was a, this i mean the the bottom of electron has quite a hefty heat shield as it is because mm -hmm. of the multiple engines you have mm -hmm. a lot of plume plume interaction and then because of that you have a lot of recirculation flow especially mm -hmm. at you know certain certain mark numbers right right so um so the heat shield is pretty decent um you know on the reentry you know we did see the heat shield collapse because the heat shield was never designed for those kind of dynamics pressures right, um, right but um you know we were still receiving solid telemetry the tanks were still pressed um systems still responding telemetry right to impact and uh yeah i mean we lost a couple of data acquisition modules and some sensors on the heat shield but that was it wow so you think it you think it looks I think pretty it was good. in good shape 
Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, all the data would show that it was it was is in remarkably good shape. Really? Mm -hmm. So, all right, so you're going to do that again? Basically, yeah. the same thing. Well, I didn't expect Flight Ten to be so successful. So I figured that um, with all of these things, you, you know, it's so hard to model and predict. Right. You, you get a little thing wrong, and then you go and learn from it. Yep. So I said to the team, right, let's do two in a row, mm -hmm. and um, you know, confirm everything. Yeah, yeah. First one, you know, we'll try our best. We'll probably learn a lot, and then we we'll, might get the second one right. Yep. Um, but you know, the second time round, uh, we'll um, we'll uh, we'll hold on to the live feed a lot longer than the second time around. Um, uh, we actually intentionally shut the you know the reentry you know camera, camera of down. the line down because okay. um, we wanted to to maintain the integrity of the data link. Mm. Data is king. Images are great. Right, right, right. Data is yep, king. Yep. So uh, we switched into a into a low bandwidth mode and shut down the camera. Okay. Um, but as it was, you know, we 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 maintain one one megabit. Uh, per second link all the way into impact so wow. we'll be able to, to to have good camera on the way in, wow. in the next one so wow that's so that's great news um so as far as so you're gonna you're gonna do basically do repeating the the thing yep. you just did on flight 10 for yep. flight 11 then uh is that when you start attaching hypersonic balloons and parachutes on flight 12. uh not flight 12. um you know, I, I expected us to have to do a lot of work um, before we would we would move to the next stage, um, I think I think we're all in kind of like a, a child giddy mode right now because <laughs> um, because we're we're you know we've got all the data we needed to proceed. So um, we'll do another <laughs> block upgrade, and mm -hmm. that'll probably take us a few flights. Um, really, and then um, then we'll get some shoots on it. Another what what if you don't mind me asking, what changes are going to happen? Shoots. So shoots, we'll get some shoots yeah. on the next one, yeah. um, and you know we, we still have we'll, we'll still have more work to do with some some decelerators. But um, what I really want to do is get it under shoots, get it back in, in one piece and in mm -hmm. the ocean, go fish it out, mm -hmm. and, um, and and do some forensics on it. That that will learn the most right. by actually of course, of course. physically inspecting the hardware. Of course, yeah. So as far as you know, maybe having more de you know aerodynamic deaccelerators, decelerators, mm -hmm. decelerators. Yeah. Uh, have you ever, has there ever been any talk about having like a the interstage kind of like peel back like some kind of flower petal or yeah, anything. Actually, the interstage, it's the wrong place you want it, believe it or not. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, that, that doesn't, it's, it, hypersonic um, flow regime is a little bit different. So is it because it ends up out, so far outside of the wake, it's just almost sitting and not doing any effect at exactly, all? Exactly, because huh. you're punching in, you know, if you get your corridor right, you've got a, you've got a big kind of shadow. So mm. you end up having to have something super big to be effective. And that's just dumb. So if you just, yeah, if you just, you know, folded your interstage over like petals. There's just there's nothing there. There's huh. no there's no flow there. So huh. that makes sense. So so you could potentially have little small air brakes pop out of the your thrust structure or something. Yeah, there's like, all sorts of different. different just regimes. expand that that surface area out a little bit yeah. more. I mean, diff different different solutions for different courses. If maybe if you had a shallower angle of attack, then those would be more effective. Mm. But our, our whole concept here is to you know is to keep the stage as cool and out of all the wind as possible. So, as far as your flight corridor, is it better for you guys to come in longer, like uh, steeper, like that, or, or straight down? It's really about angle of attack. Okay, that's that's, that's where we want to try and maintain. Okay. So, what we can look forward to in 2020 would be uh, we're going to be looking for uh, more recovery hardware. Yep. More flights. Double the double the flight rate. Double the flight rate once yep. a month. Yep. Wow. Uh, launches out of here. Yep, launch out of here. <laughs> From right here. Yeah, in you this plane wanna, bucket. Yep. We won't want to be right here when that happens. No. Uh, and then uh, anything else you guys are really looking forward to in 2020? I mean, Photon. That's not a Photon is, a, you know, next year is a big year of the satellite for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm super pumped about Photon. I think that solves a lot of problems for the industry and really lowers the boundaries and barriers for people to put stuff on orbit. That's you know, awesome. science and education, yeah. uh, commercial business, you know, it just, it just it just removes all of the all of the fuss yeah. that's in space. Yeah. So um, that'll be a big year for us next year, the first photon mission, and um, we'll see. You know, who knows? We might even uh, might even skid something to the moon. We'll I hope so. See, see how it goes. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for Thanks, your time, Tim. and congratulations on this wonderful new launch complex. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate Until it. Until next time. Ah, isn't Peter just awesome? Thanks to the folks at Rocket Lab for giving me some time with Peter and letting me pick his brain. That stuff is just super fun to me. And I owe an even bigger thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping me be able to get myself and my camera guy, Michael, out there to be able to shoot this kind of awesome stuff. If you want to help me continue to do what I do, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out everydayastronaut.com slash shop for limited edition merch. Now do notice the merchandise is getting awesome. 
We have the, you know, they're all hand screen printed, hand sewn on patches, custom neck labels, all these really cool things. And these awesome designs are limited run. So if you like something, you better grab it now because there's a good chance it won't be there next time you click on the website. And I guess you can even grab what's apparently one of Elon Musk's favorite shirts, the full flow stage combustion cycle shirt. Uh, we also have that as a hoodie version as well just in time for the cold weather. Um, so get in there while you can and get some awesome merchandise for yourself. That's everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody. That's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people.